Ian Bostridge. And it's uh, wonderful to have him here because we've been trying to get him to come and sing Schubert for, well, it seems like forever. And it's amazing. It's a dream come true that he's here. And he's, as you know, he'll be giving two concerts uh, on Friday and on Saturday. And uh, that's going to be a treat. So I hope you have your tickets uh, ready for that. It'll be wonderful. So welcome to the University of Hong Kong. Nice yes. to be here. Maybe, uh, <laughs> First time in the university, but not in Hong Kong. And you're on, you're on, on tour, is that right? Yes, I've just been in, um, in Tokyo doing uh, an um, orchestral co concert, um, some Mahler songs from the Des Knabenbundhorn set, and, uh, and then some Schubert. Right, and, right. And some Schumann and some Britain as well. Right. And I gather that in Japan, uh, the audience sang along with some of the songs? They sort of mouth the word. They know the text so yeah. sometimes. Uh, they're very... The leader is, is quite a strong... There's quite a strong leader tradition in... Right. In, in, it's not going to happen, you know, in Hong Kong. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm quite I mean, pleased. <laughs> I, used to work with a, I used to work with a very famous Japanese pianist who used to sort of sing under her breath while I was... Um, <laughs> Uh, which was quite distracting, so I'm quite <laughs> right, pleased. Right. <laughs> well, uh, uh, well, Japan has a very uh, long history with, with Germany, and so, you know, that, that whole leader tradition is just yep. part of that. So actually, it's great to be able to do this in Hong Kong, but in a way, it's a kind of an introduction uh, to leader here. So it actually, it's quite an insignificant uh, yep. event that you're right, sort of ha making happen, as it were. Right. Yeah. And also, the, other, I mean, the ironic thing is, I mean, you, you started life um, really as an academic. You were mm -hmm. uh, a junior research fellow at, in Oxford yes. uh, in history, yeah. You know, and um, so, in a way, I don't really have to have a dialogue with you. You can just give a lecture. Right? I mean, you can just <laughs> I'm very nervous of giving a lecture. I never actually gave, as an academic, I never got to the stage of giving a lecture. I've given lectures since, but uh, I never. it always seemed a very intimidating thing to have to... And I always remember that my, I have many friends who are academics, and uh, particularly I've a lot of friends who are philosophers for some reason, and they, they always... The, 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 pro the process of beginning finally to give lectures about things about which they knew nothing was very... They were suddenly having to give... You know, they'd done specialised on something very, very narrow for their doctorates, and then suddenly they were having to give a whole course sa survey on sort of from, I don't know, St. Augustine to, to, to Wittgenstein and know about everything about everything, and that seemed very intimidating to me. It is so, very scary. Yeah. So you decided to be a singer instead, yeah, which, which is, is less scary. Which is less scary, yeah. <laughs> I'm not quite sure that that's the case, but anyway, it's wonderful. I mean, but it, in, a, in a way, it's a very unusual sort of a career background. So it, uh, has being an academic in, the, in your former life, as it were, made you a very different kind of artist or distinguishes you in any way in the way you um, function? Um, I, d I don't think so because I think p performance is a very um, it's something that's lived in the moment and for me it's about a certain I mean it depends on the repertoire but certainly with, with music that can be broadly thought of as romantic it's about a sort of intensity and an extremeness of expression and trying to carry an audience with you uh, for, for example if you're doing a song recital it's it's actually very it's made up of, you know, 20, 25 songs. And what you ideally want is for nobody to sort of cough in between them and to draw, draw them through and for people not to get bored and to, to sort of, I don't know, sort of uh, uh, hypnotise them in some way. So that's very different from the process of, of academic, certainly of academic research, which, as I said, is all, I've, all I did. I, didn't, I wasn't an academic performer. I mean, no, doubtless there are many academic performers who, are, you know, have that sort of... Um, uh, performance style thing going on. The lecturing, you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know who I can think of particularly. I mean, I didn't... I always remember being... No, I mean, I can't think of any particular at Oxford. No, we're usually quite boring, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, there, are, there was a very impressive guy when I arrived at Oxford who, who gave eight lectures on Max Weber, the German soci sociologist, without notes, which I thought was really pretty amazing. But um, Especially because he'd only just invented them. Because um, it was a new subject. But no, I mean, I, I, I do, I like to study, I, I like to read around a lot of some of the stuff I do, but it's actually quite, um, I'm quite inconsistent uh, in that sometimes I'll do a piece of music and not, not learn that much about it. Uh, and sometimes I'll go into it very deeply. And sometimes it's, it's really about feeding the imagination and making sure that you will always return to the same pieces with something new. Right. And you, you mentioned several times that uh, in, in your writings that you know, you're not trained, as it were, as... Uh, no, well, not trained in music. I'm not quite mm. sure exactly what you mean by mm. that, because obviously you must yeah. be very trained in music. But, uh, I mean, you, you felt that you, you somehow you were not a musicologist or you were not... Um, I, di I didn't. I never learnt an instrument. Um, 
I, d I never really grappled with any music theory in a systematic way. Um, and so I'm, I, I picked up bits and pieces on the way since I, was, since I started being a singer. But it's, it's pretty, as I say, pretty unsystematic. Um, so I can, I mean, in, I wrote a book about Winterreiser, and in it I sort of address some points which are sort of not particularly profoundly analytical, but I mean, issues about how you play uh, triplets. Uh, but I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I don't have a deep uh, knowledge of how to name things musically, but I think a lot of it, a lot of a musician's, a performing musician's knowledge is tacit knowledge of some sort. Right, I mean, usually, I mean, you, you don't have to analyze, I mean, you kind of analyze it in the performance, I mean, in the way you interpret it, right? Yes, and I mean, I suppose with, with what we, what you'd sort of call mainstream, I don't know, German classical music, it's, it's very obvious what's going on because it's about tension and release. Um, and I, but I suppose I carry that, I don't know how it works with the p other pieces that I sing uh, and how I, I suppose I just find an emotional, an emotional connection with them. I find a way partly through the words, but it's the words plus the music and it's, it's a form of acting really. Right, right. Um, yeah, no, I think actually German music, I mean, classical music and all that, is uh, highly dramatic. Mm. In fact, the whole operatic basis is very important. But let's move on to talking about Schubert, mm -hmm. uh, the two song cycles. Um, maybe you could uh, explain a little bit about these um, two song cycles to, to the audience, just to sort of fill them in a little bit, because they're quite similar in a way, because they're both about journeys, and yeah. they both end badly, <laughs> as yes. it were. Yeah. So maybe you could just say a little bit about the two and how they are similar and also different. Yeah, well, the, the first one, Die schöne Müllerin, the beautiful Miller girl, is it's it's takes a set of poems that were actually written by a, um, a man called Wilhelm Müller, but they came out of a sort of um, a sort of domestic game. They they took they they, they sort of were all sitting around of an evening and they invented these these characters and so it's it's got a sort of um, self conscious archness about it in its original form, and it's got. Um, it's got introductory poems which sort of distance from the story. The story is, is a very simple one. It's that um, uh, a, a journeyman miller is, is traveling you know, to look for a new job. He finds a new job, falls in love with a girl, talks but can't really talk to her. He's a bit, he's, he's, he's a bit scared of her. Talks a lot to this bubbling brook which gives lots of opportunities for bub bubbly br brook music in the piano. Um, and um, he thinks maybe she's, she likes him but uh, of course, then the hairy hunter comes along, and uh, this masculine macho figure, and he manages to, uh, you know, get her. And uh, the in the end, the miller boy throws himself into the into the mill, and the cycle ends with a uh, with a lullaby sung by the by the mill itself. So it's a sort of, in one sense, it's sort of very, it's faux naive um, and arch and artful as poetry. But what Schubert did. Um, and he he composed it in the year in which he was uh, diagnosed with syphilis, and probably wrote some of it in hospital. Um, he stripped away the irony. He took away all the all the poems that are in the as it were the narrator's voice, which comment on that, and he made it much simpler in that way. Uh, and it's really it's actually although it's simple, it's it's very deep because it's about the connection somehow between a sort of Freudian connection between sex and death. Um, but it's written in a, the music is, um, the music's sort of simple. I mean, a lot of the songs are what we call strophic songs, so that you have the same music repeated four or five times for different verses. Some of them are, are through composed. Um, and um, it's really the, f it's, you know, this was a very early point, 1820 three for the for the song cycle it's um it, it, you know beethoven had, had written one and he found a Galipta, but that's a very short sort of 30 minute thing and this thing is an hour long it's a big it's a big piece it's a lot to take on um so that's shona Millerin, a journey from uh sort of you can either it's interesting how you treat the miller boy you can either see him as being a sort of ordinary sort of uh rustic bloke who 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 arrives in our purview as sort of you know quite ordinary and but slowly goes crazy through the course of the of the um cycle or you can start out thinking that he's probably a little bit psychotic at the beginning because he's talking to rivers which is a rather strange thing to do um and that 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 those are the choices you make as a as a performer how to have where where the flip comes um uh 
what, so, what do you do? I mean, do you take I tend, kind of I tend to be the I tend to be uh, towards the lunatic side, but I right. try and pull it back. I mean, one of the things about performing is when you've gone too far in one direction, you think, oh my god, I better pull back and and try and get a bit less expressionistic, a, a bit more classically balanced. Uh, but there are so many ways of, of doing a piece like like um, Schöne Mitteilung because there's there's so much going on and so many interrelating parts to to to. And once you take a once you make a decision in one song, then it's going to have an um, impact on how you do some, another song, and it's different every time. Um, so, in 1827, Schubert discovered 12 um, poems by the same poet. Um, he just uh, Wilhelm Müller. He discovered them in a um, in a in a banned publication. This was the period in Vienna of of of, of the Metternich reaction after the after the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. So. Th Political life was, it wasn't exactly, it wasn't tyrannical, it was just very repressed. Politics wasn't something you were supposed to discuss, and people got together to make music in their houses, and they didn't, they steered away from politics pretty much. But as a result, there's a lot of coded political commentary, and Wilhelm Müller, is one who, who actually lived, lived in Germany, in one of the German states in Anhalt Dessau, was, um, he was one of these people who is making s sort of secret coded political uh, gestures of opposition against this 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 repression this this lack of but it was particularly uh, connected with it was liberal minded but it was also it was nationalistic because what metternich who was the austrian chancellor or the habsburg chancellor what he was trying to do was stop german nationalism destroying the austro uh, austrian the habsburg empire the austro-hungarian empire because it was a non um, non-national, uh, a sort of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, a multinational, international um, organization. So, Miller composed this, uh, wrote these this, this 12 poems called Winterreise, Winter's Journey. And that in itself is a sort of metaphor for, um, this is the ice site, this is the ice time, everything's sort of frozen, nothing's happening, nothing's changing, things are repressed. It's a, it's a, it's a metaphor, a, a political metaphor that was taken up uh, much later by the much more famous poet Heinrich Heine, who, who was greatly influenced by, by, um, by Wilhelm Müller. Anyway, Schubert found these poems, and he, I think, in a great, was totally seized by them, and in a great hurry composed 12 songs. Um, and then, some months later, um, he discovered that Müller had actually written 12 more poems, but in, and had put them all in a different order, which was probably a bit annoying. Uh, but instead of um, sort of re reordering it all, he just he took out the extra ones and, and composed them in order, except one of them he reversed because he wanted a fast song in a particular place. And, and so we have, have this, this enormous, enormous um, leader thing, which stands right at the beginning of the leader tradition. And leader in the 19th century were huge, but this, this monument, this 70, 75 minute long piece is it's the greatest work in the leader tradition probably and it stands almost right at the beginning. And it's a it's a journey, but it's a journey in which nothing much happens because we don't it starts with um the protagonist uh like a sort of Byronic hero leaving the scene of a of a nameless crime. I mean it's not really a crime, it's something to do with a girl and he's leaving because either she he can't cope or she doesn't like him or but we're never really told. He leaves the house. And he goes out into a winter landscape. And he, I suppose what he does through the 24 songs of Winterizer is to confront issues of identity, mortality, aging, uh, um, loneliness, all the sort of very sort of abstract qualities of the human condition. And th that's why it stands as one of the sort of great works of... I mean, I, 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 one of the reasons I wrote a book about it is because I think it's it's sort of hugely appreciated in the leader world. It's hugely appreciated in the musical world, but I don't think it people, you know. Uh, now, I st I still sort of believe in a canon of great artistic works. Uh, I probably have a very narrow canon, a, a, a canon that's much too narrow. But Winterizer is one of those pieces that I th like. You know, I don't know the novels of Tolstoy or. Um, or I mean, all sorts of things in many different cultures that 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 need to be confronted, or you're missing out if you're not confronting them. So I, j I just wanted to um, put that out there. See, I tricked you into giving a lecture. After all. <laughs> <laughs> um.
I'm so clever. But no. I'm now so aware, in fact, of how limited, because I'm not now in, 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 in Europe, I'm so aware of how I'm, I'm my, my particular acculturation or my, my particular culture is actually very narrow. And, you know, Vinterizer is a it's very important work, but I, I'm not... I'm not aware of, of so much of, 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 of the great works of, of non-Western culture. But uh, I should just add, it's, it's a great book, by the way. So, uh, and it's actually available in our bookshop. So you yeah, can yeah. go and go and buy it. It's terrific. Um, so, uh, so, so a venturizer obviously, is uh, a kind of also a journey towards a kind of uh, po a possible suicide or death in some form as well, right? It's very similar to... Uh, the Shona Mullerin uh, yeah. in, in that sense. I think it's a journey towards the the, the inability to, uh, uh, to to embrace. I mean, it's it's rather Beckett, it's it's rather you know it's like Sam, it's, it's like a Samuel Beckett play. Samuel Beckett loved Vinterizer. Um and it's got it's rather a Samuel Beckett sort of landscape. You know, snow and a tree and very bare, and and it's all about you know um, uh, failing better or about carrying on. You, you're, the only thing you've got to do is carry on. You can't stop going. So that, 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 it's non-narrative in that way. It's right, it's kind of like Schubert and Waiting for Godot kind of yeah. put together. Yeah. Cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about your own um, kind of experience of Schubert because obviously you've been singing these two song cycles for a very long time. I mean, it must be like almost 30 years or, or more. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, st I started singing Die Schöne Müllerin as an, as an adolescent because I had I sort of... Uh, modeled my own experience on the song cycle in some strange way because I fell in love with a girl who didn't really like me and went off with a guy from the tennis club. Right. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't play tennis. So he was like the hairy hunter. Right. And uh, I used to walk up and down the street singing the songs under my breath, oh, sort of happy, hoping to catch a glimpse of her. So that's Shona Mullerin. Oh, right. Uh, Did you speak to the Thames in River? No, 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 no. no. I, there was no river. I was okay, in a okay. South London okay. suburb called oh. Streatham, and there was no river. Oh, Streatham, yes. Venterizer <laughs> um, I got to know a bit later. Um, mainly to begin with from recordings. I, I fell in love with the work of a, of a German baritone called Dietrich fischer dieskau who was the great leader singer of the 20th century. And I listened to a lot of him singing Winterreiser. But I did actually rather romantically miss my only opportunity to hear him sing Winterreiser because my girlfriend's mother was going out that evening and it meant I could actually spend some time with her at home. So I didn't go and hear <laughs> fischer dieskau sing Winterreiser. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, oh, but um, <laughs> Winterreiser, I, lear I learnt... In fact, the same girlfriend, yeah. I, uh, um, when, she, when she decided she didn't want to go out with me anymore, I was at Oxford, and I thought the best possible way of winning her back was to learn Winterreiser and sing it in a concert in Oxford in January 1985. And she came with her mother and her sister, but it, uh, not surprisingly, it didn't work. But um, that was... That it was, was a bit grim the, as a kind of love song. <laughs> it was the very first time I sang Winterreiser. I thought it was very impressive that I'd learnt all the words. Um, so I, I've been singing, singing them both for a very long time. So, so you have a particular affinity, you think, with Schubert? Yeah. I mean, I think Schubert's one of those composers who people um, develop a sort of personal relationship with. I mean, there's a lot of talk in the academic literature about this idea of my Schubert and how people get very, very mm -hmm. attached to him as a person. But he's, he's very, he's a, it's partly because he's so mysterious. It's difficult to know. You can t there's a sort of... I've called it the tubby tunesmith Schubert, who's a sort of jolly fellow who used to play at parties. And but if you read a lot of the comments of his friends, you know he was he was he was up and down, at, you know, withdrawing from the social scene at certain times. I mean, he had a lot to to suffer in his life, and his life was very short. So, um, I mean, to suffer the and not he mean to suffer the treatment for syphilis above all, which involved sort of massive quantities of mercury ointment and. Uh, hair falling out, and and also to suffer the fear of what syphilis, if it carried through to tertiary syphilis, might bring in terms of uh, mental de degeneration. And it's one of the interesting things in in Winterreiser that you know you end up with this song, one of the most weird and famous songs in 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 the leader tradition, uh, Der Leiermann, the the um, hurdy gurdy player, and you've got this sort of—I think it's called—is it called non-functional harmony? I mean, nothing happened. You're, you're sort of yeah, it's kind of like a kind of drone that goes yeah. on, right? And yes, and, and you quite finish. You feel it's like somebody crazy playing who can't get out of their repetitive pattern of mental uh, behavior. Right. And of course, you know, it, it's a little bit unfair just to talk about the singer in, in, in leader because obviously the piano plays yeah. such a, a crucial part in this. I mean, how do you? Uh, understand the piano part then in, in, in this in Schubert's uh, song cycles. I mean, the, the piano is crucial because it's really the invention of the piano um, 
of a sort of s sus sustaining quasi-symphonic instrument that allows the development of the leet. I mean, you know, leet just means song, and of course there have always been songs. But what you get in uh, the 19th century, first of all in the, in the German tradition, and then it's passed on to, particularly to the French, the melody tradition, you get this um, harmonic complexity and this sense that the piano is a protagonist in some way, or at least... I like to think of it, again, in sort of Freudian terms, that it's as if the the, um, the singer is the sort of ego, and the uh, and the and the piano is the is two things at once. Actually, it's the id. It's these sur it's these surges of emotion, um, or of psychic the, this psychic phenomenon underlying everything. Plus, of course, it's able to imitate um, the natural the natural world uh, in a f in a strange way because it's not clear why. I mean, it's a, it, I suppose like they're, they're, they're sort of um, topics, aren't they? they that certain piano figures come to be associated with, you know, the rustling of leaves or the or the uh, the bubbling of water or the most famously in the Schubert song Erlkönig, uh, a horse galloping uh, through a forest, just repeated octaves. Da -da 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 now, of course, that doesn't sound anything like a horse, but somehow we're told it's a horse in the poem, and then we think of it as a horse. So. Um, so th the piano is absolutely crucial, um, but I suppose in the in the concert situation, it's the the singer is the is the front person who's doing the acting. So uh, the p very often the pianist and the piano part doesn't get enough attention, uh, even from people who should know better. And you know, you often read reviews of leader recitals where the pianist is barely mentioned at all, except to say how how, how sensitive, which is the most irritating possible thing to be called if you're a pianist. Um, so no, I mean the piano is, is crucial. Yeah. Yeah, but also, I, I think, as you said, you know, song has been going on for a long time. Mm. But now we have a, kind, a leader, a, a leader tradition developing, where somehow, the, as you said, the piano somehow gets sort of inside you. Right? It's a kind yeah. of psychological inner commentary uh, yes. on, on on the poem that's going on. Yeah, and that's what seized me when I first heard it on on on, on record. I think, but it's a sort of I mean, it's a limited historical. Phenomenon. I mean, it comes. It comes. It's sort of born in the 1820s, and it, what happens in the course of the 19th century is it gets. Um, it starts as a domestic, essentially a domestic genre. I mean, it's it's one of these things. that's on the cusp. I mean, something like Winterreiser was wasn't um, or Schoenemüller. They they weren't performed in concerts. Maybe occasionally ac extracts were. People would have them at home. They'd maybe sing them to themselves. Schubert famously performed Winterreiser to his friends, but. Winterreiser wasn't performed as a concert piece in total until the mid 1850s, um, and then you start to get uh, composers uh, becoming Im uh, more and more involved. It becomes a, a more and more high status art form rather than a low status art form, which it had been before. Everybody has to uh, compose leader in the German tradition. Uh, there are you know dozens and dozens of recitals every week in german in german cities in the late 19th century and and the genre becomes more and more complicated it becomes more and more professionalized um in the hands of people like ugo wolf um it it becomes turns into orchestral song in the hands of someone like gustav mahler and then by the time you get to the 20th century that um sort of professionalization complication making it getting more and more difficult plus the invention of the of the gramophone sort of pulls the rug out from underneath uh, the leet. And I think, you know, there are uh, fewer and fewer people composing leader as you go through the 20th century. And the la for me, the last great leader composer is actually probably um, an English composer, ben Benjamin Britten, who, who loved the leet, performed a lot of leader, and composed, you know, seven or eight um, amazing song cycles in the German, tra sort of in the German tradition. Yeah, especially for tenor, right? Yeah, <laughs> especially. that's very nice. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I was also thinking about uh, how a, a professor uh, uh, that I used to study with, a uh, very famous uh, music theorist called David Lewin, he worked a lot on Schubert, and he always mentioned that Schubert was like this naive genius, because in a way he just wrote a lot of music, he just mm -hmm. kept going. But somehow when you look at this music, I mean, the, the, the profundity, there, right? even in a simple song, it's, mm. it's amazing, and you can keep going deeper and deeper. And when you look at the text and the music, there's almost a kind of perfect marriage between yeah. German lyric poetry and the music that Schubert yeah. is writing. I'm just wondering, and for you, I mean, why do you think this type of poetry sort of works so well w with Schubert? Um, it's, I suppose German poetry is quite of that period is quite. It has a degree of simplicity 
simplicity, but um, certainly compared to, to German prose, and uh, which is much more contorted and complicated to understand, um, for me anyway. Uh, I. It's interesting because some of the best songs have ter poems that are terrible, um, that, that are on their own. I mean, there's a very amazing song called Der Zwerg, the Dwarf, which uses the the fate motif from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Dum 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 goes all the way through, and it's a it's a gothic melodrama in four minutes about we we sort of focus in on a ship and on the ship is the dwarf and the queen. And the queen has somehow betrayed the dwarf with the king. And in the end, the, the dwarf um, strangles her with a cord and throws her in the ocean. And then we see him sort of sailing off like the Flying Dutchman. He will never, he will sail on forever and never land. Um, and it's a in many ways, it's a completely ridiculous poem. Um, but it makes, Schubert somehow takes the poem, sort of eviscerates it, gives it, a, gives it some sort of musical meaning which he drives through it and uh, the sounds of it, it you wouldn't want not to have the poem it's not that the sort of it's good despite the poem the poem is definitely part of it the, the the scene that's summoned up and also the sounds of the words so um it's a bit i always think it was, it's, it's a sort of it's a mysterious process the way that um it's like a sort of transubstantiation the way that a, 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 a poem is turned into a song in that way and th I mean, the elements, in, particularly in um, uh, Wilhelm Müller's uh, poetry, where uh, he doesn't give you a lot of stuff. I mean, there's a kind mm. of absence there as well, yeah. right? That, that means that, you, I guess, music can yeah. start articulating or at least explore that space. And he, he said that himself. He said, I'm just waiting for somebody to, to... He said it a couple of times, once in a letter and I think once in public, um, that he was waiting for somebody to compose his, his songs he, they, he always wrote them to be set to music and they have this sort of um very typical romantic strategy of, of leaving a, a a sort of mystery at the core we don't quite know what goes on it's something that that byron did and also walter scott did in his poetry so you project the 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 the, 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 the readers or the list they, they project their own experiences onto it and it therefore reflects back much more powerfully um yeah now that you've you know sung these songs for you know so long, uh, I just wonder whether there were any particular song in either of these cycles that you um, have uh, you've just sort of discovered more and more every time. And it, it just got deeper for you, and you sort of interpret it differently now than you had when you started thirty years ago. Well, the main change in my experience is is is, um, is a more banal one, which is with the first song. It's 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 the longest song in the cycle, and I used to find it unbearably long and I think thought everyone would got very bored. This is Winterreise. Yeah, the yeah. Gute Nacht. And now I'm much more comfortable with it and I know how it, how it works. I feel, I don't feel uncomfortable delivering it. Um, the, I don't know, I, I sort of see the whole, it, it all seems, it seems to work as a, a whole in a way. Um, that's the thing I suppose I experience and have experienced more as I've, as, as I've performed the piece is just experience it, experiencing it as a sort of single arc. Um, I can't think of any particular change in any any one song. What about with pianists? Because you've played, uh, I mean, you've, you've sung these uh, pieces with many different pianists mm. and some extraordinary ones, including mm. uh, Ushida. Yeah. There's a recording with, with her. And then you've worked with uh, people who are just accompanists, accompanists yeah. as they were, like uh, Judas Drake and Graham yeah. Johnson. And then even with the composer Tom Medez, yeah. right? So I'm just wondering, do they contribute to your interpretation, or do they make, do they play in such a way that you know it really kind of changes things for you? Oh, it definitely does. It, it but it doesn't always involve um, sort of discussion. It's just it's something that comes out of of performance in a way that you know. Um, I mean, s some musical experiences involve a sort of exchange of ideas and talking about it. But I, I'm always struck by. So a conductor like Claudio Abbado, who you know he didn't, he never really did much in the rehearsal or said very much, and it all was all it all came out of his hands in the apparently in the in the actual concert. And um, with pieces like this that, that both I and the people I'm working with know very well, it sort of happens in the moment. But it does, of course, it makes a huge difference. And it's always the pianist, for example, who sets the tempo. Uh, um, the most the most different experience was really working with with Tom Adas because he he did I mean it, it sounds like a sort of cliche and it's sort of obvious but he did bring a sort of composer's eye to it. Um, I just did a couple of 
performances of it. I mean, I've done it with him a lot on tour in the States, on tour in Europe, and then we just did two performances in London, which we recorded. And um, he has, because he's not a, uh, a full-time pianist, he has quite an idiosyncratic piano technique. Um, but also, so he will, he'll, uh, which suits me very well, because he'll do it quite exaggerated things. And he'll bring out, I mean, if you look at the markings in Schubert, they're often quite, um, they're quite exaggerated, what he wants to, where he wants you to emphasize a word. And it's, it goes against, I think, one of my bugbears, which is this notion that um, Schubert is a sort of, uh, uh, it's something that should be sung just naturally, uh, with no interpretation, and that we don't want any interference with it, we just let it happen, which, that's anathema to me. And I don't think it's true to what Schubert actually does if you look at the way he marks his work and the way he composes. Um, so Tom would respond to that, and also he looked at the um, he went back and looked at the autograph score, which is in the um, Pierpont Morgan Library in New York. It's a rather extraordinary score. There's it come the first twelve songs. It's actually it's actually what he wrote down as he was composing it. So there's sort of crossings out, and it's it's quite difficult to read. The second half is a fair copy, um, but he found really interesting things that nobody had noticed. Uh, uh, different uh, it's chords that were slightly different and slightly odd, rhythms that were slightly different and slightly odd, and things that actually, um, bizarrely, hadn't been picked up by the um, by the the critical edition, the Baron Wright critical edition, edited by Walter Dürer, um, which was a surprise. Right, so that, we look forward to that recording. Yeah. And then, uh, what about working with someone like Ushida, where I mean, obviously she's a concert pianist, so she yeah. would have a very different take on how it should be done, I guess. Um. Yeah, I mean she's uh, she's a wonderful pianist, and it's it's but it doesn't seem that uh, she's actually the person who sings along. Oh, she <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but she loves this. She loves this music, and she's known it for you know. She was brought up in her father was the Japanese ambassador to Vienna, so she's the sort of Viennese, uh, and it's part of her formation and. Um, and she plays, you know, she plays it wonderfully. So, but it's not singularly. I wouldn't say it's singularly different from doing it with right. um, uh, a so-called accompanist. Right, right, right. Um, with these two cycles, I think it's nice to put it in a bit of context because, in a way, um, both of them are a little bit dark, um, yeah. and uh, also, I mean, the aspects about them of, of loneliness and alienation. This kind of death wish, yeah. and this kind of full, uh, this I guess uh, unrequited love that's sort of just yeah. haunting the whole thing. I mean, w how I mean, and, and also I mean the other thing about this that you know uh, that you should know is that it, this so these two song cycles sort of became part of the whole German psyche. Really, I mean mm -hmm. they were sort of not only a tradition that was sung, but it became part of what it meant to be German mm -hmm. and that whole sense of identity. That's why I think people can sort of. Get, you know, sing yeah. along with these uh, with, with these Schubert songs. So maybe you can fill us a little bit in about uh, the con the historical context for this type of r rather grim sort of narrative that sort of just takes hold of the German imagination. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a tradition in writing about Germany um, that sort of this idea of a of a the Zondervik, the, the the exceptional past that Germany took, and trying to explain why. Germany reached what it reached in uh, in the Nazi time, um, and it looks back into the nineteenth century and it tries to find roots in even in German, first certain things about German romanticism, this sort of uh, death of death obsession, and there's sort of something as if there's something unhealthy about it. And I think it's probably I think that's sort of probably barking up the wrong tree because um, you know. Um, I am myself. Half, what is it? I am half in uh, in love with easeful death, or something. Keats says it's it's um, it's a common romantic trope, and it's also a common feature of human experience. I think, and, and again, you find it. In, I mean, it's a German uh, psychoanalysis is German, but still, you, this sort of the poles of you know of eros and thanatos of of, of sex and death. They do dominate, you know, and by you know biologically that they are dominant features of of, of human experience. So, I, um. I think the leader tradition reflects that, and I. Uh, but it did become a very important part of uh, of German culture. A lot, a lot, some of the songs that Schubert composed became, as it were, folk songs. Uh, particularly the fifth song of uh, Winterreise, Der Lindenbaum, the, Lind the, the Linden Tree, 
which was sort of slightly bastardized and simplified by a, by a German composer in the mid-19th century and became the sort of song that people sang when they went hiking or out with the Boy Scouts. Um, and then uh, I think it's in, it particularly, I talk about this in my book, um, in a novel by Thomas Mann called The, the Magic Mountain, he, which is a, is, a, is, a, is a funny book because it's, it's written, he, he started it um, probably, I think, around, you know, he wrote the very famous novella Death in Venice in 1912, and then the First World War broke out. And I think Magic Mountain was the project that was on the boil all this time. He didn't write, really write another novel, having ri written the famous novel Buddenbrooks earlier. He didn't really write another novel until the 1920s. But in the, at the beginning of the First World War, he was a real arch-German nationalist, um, sort of you know, was there for German culture, the idea of culture, uh, sort of deep culture against frivolous French civilization, the, 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 the idea that there was something specially culture-bearing about, about, about the German people. Um, and he then, at the end of the war, he turned against that greatly. And, and in a way, The Magic Mountain, which is a, is a novel set in a, in a sanatorium uh, where somebody is sort of consumed by possibly imagined tuberculosis but it's it, it's a it's an it's a sort of a apologia for for that attitude it's sort of saying there is some there was something sick and unhealthy about german culture and i was part of it and here i'm i'm saying goodbye to it and one of the central ways he expresses that in the magic mountain is by the introduction of the song der lindenbaum the one i just talked about the one that became a folk song and 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 saying that that is a sort of um symbol of german longing for death and he, he puts it into a scene in the sanatorium, but then at the very end of the book, the guy in the sanatorium leaves and goes off to fight in the trenches in the, in the First World War, and he sings uh, one of the lines from Der Linderbaum as he's sort of going over the top and marching through the mud. And So it, it, it definitely does have that image in German culture, but I'm not sure it's entirely... It's not, I'm not sure it's that simple. Right, right, but this is this kind of the German culture that leads to war, as it were. And I think yeah. actually, I mean, just as a kind of uh, counterpart to the Thomas Mann mm -hmm. Magic Mountain, there's of course Dr. Faustus, yeah. where it's really a Beethoven Schoenberg book that basically does the whole thing again, as yeah. it were, but from the, from the lens of Beethoven and Schoenberg. So there's yeah. obviously something very musical about Thomas Mann. Um, but you, let, let's bring it back, you know, from this very long kind of historical trajectory and go back to the time of Schubert. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you mentioned briefly there that, that you thought that politics also played quite a strong role uh, in the formation of these poems and these songs. Yeah. And what, what is this context? And Because most people would put it, you know, I mean, this kind of death wish and all that kind of an alienation in the context of poor old Schubert, you know, he's dying and, and all that kind of stuff. But obviously he wouldn't have known he was necessarily dying when he was yeah. writing uh, these song cycles. So well, I think he knew, he, he did know he was dying, that's the thing. I mean, he didn't die of what he would have died of. Right. He probably died of, um, of, of eating some bad fish or something, but he would have died in the end of syphilis and he would have been aware of that. Um, but uh, th there's just a sort of political under li code, little coded messages, the whole, the whole idea of a winter time, the whole idea of, uh, there's, there's one particular, there's one that I decoded, which I, I mean, it's trivial, but I liked the fact that I managed to decode it, which is, there's a, um, the tenth song of Winterizer is called Rast or Rest. And in the second verse of it, um, he, um, he takes refuge from this snowy landscape in, a, in the narrow house of a charcoal burner. And it always seemed very, very, specific to me and I wondered why on earth it was a charcoal burner and then it became clear to me that actually Müller was putting in this a charcoal burner because charcoal burner in it uh, he was Müller wrote a book about Italy as part and fulfilled that with secret political protest and the the revolutionaries in the nationalist revolutionaries in Italy who were fighting against the the the, the Austrian domination of of and the and the, the, the Neapolitan domination of, of 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 parts of Italy they were called the Carbonari which means charcoal burners so here's this sort of little secret uh, pointer towards it's like you know this is a Winterizer it, it's not that it's a political it's not a piece of political action it's not even a piece of political theatre. But people could sing it and uh, and perform it together and feel, I suppose, unified in a state of sort of silent protest. It's a it's a it's an act of solidarity in that way. Maybe it's not just what it appears on the surface. It's uh, which is a you know a, a song cycle about alienation and disappointed love and so on. Right. What about um, we, we talked about it a little bit just now about. Uh, 
reading Schubert's life mm -hmm. uh, into this, a little bit about death. But I mean, what about other aspects of his life? Do you, uh, do you understand these songs also from a, kind of, as it were, a kind of biographical angle in terms of Schubert's own experiences? Y yes, I mean, he definitely, um, I think he would have been seized by certain aspects of, um, of Winterreiser when he, when he got his hands on the poems, which related to his own life. I mean, the first song, always seemed a bit of a mystery to me, he, uh, the first poem. Um, it's, it, uh, a man is leaving a, ha a house in the middle of the night, leaving uh, behind, uh, it says, the, the girl talked of love, the, the mother of marriage, and he's going out into a snowy landscape. You think, why was this man staying in this house? Who was he? What, how can we make sense of it socially in the 1820s, uh, a man staying in a house and then leaving. What was his relationship to the f this family? And one way of understanding it that came to me is that he's actually um, a, house, a house tutor. This is a very common phenomenon. You, it's, it starts in, in fiction in the, in the 18th century in, in, in Rousseau's Nouvelle Héloise, but it's also the experience of a lot of the sort of philosophers and thinkers of the, of, of, of the, um, of, of the late 18th and early 19th century that they worked as, as tutors private tutors in the, in the houses of the upper middle class, and sometimes got into trouble, uh, either with the daughter or with, in the case of Hölderlin, the poet, he fell in love with, with, with the wife. So, and this happened to Schubert. Uh, he went to teach the um, Esterhazy girls in Zelitz in Hungary, and he sort of fell in love with one of them. And so I think this would have, you know, he would have felt a connection with that poem. And similarly, I think he would have felt a connection, as I said before, with the, with the the idea that this this cycle ends with a vision of a of a an old destitute musician, the lyreman, the the hurdy gurdy man, playing in the snow with with gnarled fingers and repeating the same thing over and over again. He would have seen that partly as a vision of you know the insecurity and poverty of the musician, and partly as a prediction of his own mental uh, degeneration. Yeah. So there are, I think, there are always. I don't think we should shy away from the biographical. I think there's a there's a sort of embarrassment about biographical criticism, which I don't really understand. I mean, I I I, um, I think it's the human interest of 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 music is important. I mean, music is not isn't a sort of it's not a cosmic um, detached uh, absolute. Thing it's actually it's a it's an expression of human interest and human emotion and and human relationships. I mean that's why people make music. That's what music is about. Uh, particularly in that period where life and yeah. art kind of merged really yeah. uh, with a lot of these romantics. Because I think the talk of tutors is very uh, would uh, sort of ring a bell in Hong Kong because Hong Kong people love tutors. I mean right. you know <laughs> so maybe the, the winterize will mean new things right. <laughs> in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what about uh, other aspects that are, that are common between the two cycles? I mean. There's a lot about nature. I mean, nature seems to be almost a protagonist or, or some yeah. sort of character, right, in, in both yeah. Uh, cycles. Y yes. I mean, in, in the first cycle, I mean, the, the, you can see the, the, the brook, the, the Bechlein that he starts talking to as a sort of cosy, friendly figure. But I suppose it, in the end, it's the, it's the crazy relationship with the brook that leads him to commit suicide, and he does commit suicide by jumping into the brook. So it's 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 cozy, but maybe at the same time threatening. It's a bit fairy tale somehow. Um, in Winterizer, you've you've got um, aspects of nature which are you know you've got the you've you've got the icy cold. You've got things blowing into his face. Uh, particularly striking, you've got this uh, crow uh, about halfway through the cycle that follows him, circling above his head in a very creepy way. It's a wonderful piece of writing in the piano. Um, and is basically waiting, he knows he's waiting for him to collapse so that he can pick his bones. And there's something almost sort of erotic in the, re in the relationship, the sort of, re it's the, er the erotic death, the sort of, um, yeah. yeah. And nature also, I mean, I, I'm, because I'm a Beethoven scholar, so it, it seems very different from Beethoven's relationship mm -hmm. with nature, which is always, you know, in the pastoral symphony, much more uh, religious in a way. Whereas right. Schubert, it's, nature seems to be very, well, objective, and uh, even though you read so much into nature, nature in the end. Yeah, it's funny because I mean that it's it's. Yeah, I mean in Winterreiser, I think nature is the whole thing is that you can try and nature is 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 outside and it's 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 either it doesn't care. I mean this is the thing about the period in which Schubert's growing up. It is the beginning. I mean, there had this thing has had many beginnings, but it is a period in which. 
Um, Deep, for example, deep time is being discovered. That, that, uh, you know, the idea that it isn't that the, the universe is 4,000 years old. It's actually much, much older. Things have been going on for a long time. It, it, human beings seem smaller. The universe seems bigger. There seems maybe a, l a loss of personal relationship to the universe and to the natural world uh, and a feeling of a, what was it, deus absconditus, that, it, it, that maybe God... I mean, Schubert's c complicated because he's clearly... His attitude to religion is a conflicted one. I mean, he's uh, he writes some very pious pieces, but he's also he leaves out bits of uh, crucial bits of um, of the mass to, to to signal the fact that he's not actually a really a totally orthodox Catholic. Um, and uh, and it, you know, there's I I don't know what, what the, the the big symphony, the great, is 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 seen by many people as a sort of deist sort of reaction to the glory of the mountains. And uh, but I I think Schubert's Universe is much more scary. It's a sh it's a it's a universe where human beings are alone. It's a sort of existentialist, as I said before, sort of Beckettian universe where um, we mustn't fantasize that there's any th any consolation. Oh, very grim. Um, maybe, maybe two questions before we open it out to, uh, to the floor. Um, the first is what what is your most memorable performance of uh, either of these Schubert cycles, or the most surprising performance you've Oof. ever given? <laughs> um, oh, golly. Um, in a totally vain way, uh, and probably ignoble way, um, I, d I did a performance at the Barbican Theatre, uh, Bar Barbican Concert Hall in London, with Thomas Addis, just after my book had been published. And the Barbican Concert Hall is a sort of big concert hall, and I thought, oh my God, nobody's going to come. But because the book had come out, and it had been on the radio, it was full, and it was incredibly, in a very um, childish and naive way, very ex very exciting that there were so many people there. And it created a different, a different audience creates a different dynamic, and it made it a much bigger Winterizer. I mean, Vin these pieces were written for small, well, they weren't written for anything, but they were first performed in small domestic environments, and y the ideal is always thought to be, you know, um, a, a hall like the Wigmore Hall in London, you know, 500 seats or, but to perform Winterizer in a big hall like Carnegie Hall, or like La Scala or the Barbican, you just create a different sort of piece, and it's very exciting. And I found performing in all those three places very exciting, in a very, as I said, in a slightly, you're not really supposed to say that, it's a bit ignoble, but it's exciting to, to do these pieces in big spaces, big famous spaces. Um, the most influential thing on me in doing Winterizer was really um, making a film about it in the Schubert Bicentenary year in 1997, because I think I'd been, until then, quite sort of, classical and balanced in my approach to it. But making this film, I worked with a director called David Alden, and he sort of pushed me to the edge. And I found it at the time very irritating. Uh, and we made a film about it that showed how irritating it seemed. But in the end, I think, over the years, it's had a big influence on, on how I do it. Um, with Shona Mullerin, I shy away from it. Shona Mullerin is actually much more difficult than Vinterosa because it's sort of, it's perfect, and it requires much more careful approach to the voice than Vinterizer. So it's, um, I don't have so many memorable experiences of it, somehow. The scary ones about having to be perfect. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's Vin Vinterizer sort of winds down. So I mean, if you, if you feel, it's a long thing, and if you, f you, you it, it's, you could almost speak Vinterizer. I mean, it's, whereas you really have to be on vocal, you know, have to really concentrate. Right, so and it's much more of a narrative with yes. uh, with a Muller in, and also it ends fast. I mean, it has a, it's, it's a big ending. I mean, yeah, it suddenly degenerates. You know, you, you go along to the 12th song and then suddenly it's all the way down. Right, um, yeah. yeah. But the second question was, uh, you know, because some of us are sort of just getting into leader, but into these Schubert song mm -hmm. cycles. So what's the best way of really getting into this music? I mean, uh, next, I'm not singing them because we're not all capable of doing that. Yeah. But what, I what is the best way of sort of um, trying to get a grip of this music? Well, I, I still think that Dietrich fischer dieskau is the greatest singer of this music and that everybody should listen to him singing it. I mean, it's not... His aesthetic is um, very different from mine. And I, w I always used to worry when I was younger that he was... I knew him a bit, and I was always worried that he was going to come to a concert and hate it. And in fact, I'd sometimes I used to... Fant I used to there used to be somebody in the audience who looked a bit like him, and I'd think, oh, my God. Um, He's over there. <laughs> because he was quite, you know, his demeanor was quite classical in a way. Although, he, as he got older, it got a bit more expressionistic. But anyway, he never did come to one of my concerts, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> well, so I think. He didn't go to his, so he yeah. didn't go to yours. But I think the thing about classical, I mean, not all, I mean, I don't know. I, th I think the thing about most really things that are worth investigating culturally is that they benefit from preparation. 
and you get more the more you put in the more you get out and i think we live in a culture where um it's quite often people just want to something to be to immediately get it mm. and i think you know it's worth prepare i mean none of us have time of course but it's worth preparing to go to a lead recital it's worth looking at the texts before you go to the concert because then you can look at the singer and the pianist and not sort of be looking at the text uh, it's worth reading my book about Mintrose. Uh, <laughs> it's and it's worth available in our bookshop, <laughs> <laughs> and it's worth listening to to diff maybe to different different singers, different styles. So we've got so much available now, uh, uh, so easily on on YouTube and Spotify. You can hear the different ways people have done it over the years, and uh, that's fascinating in itself. So yeah, I think um, a little bit of immersion, and then go to go to leader recitals because they are that's the thing, that's the real thing. That's that's it's a and it, you know it's a, it's an art form that's developed. It's not anything Schubert, in a sense, would have recognised. It's developed historically, and it's become a particular sort of thing at this particular time. Um, but it's, I think it's a, it's a wonderful development and a very intense and direct form of, of music making. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just as dramatic as, as opera, but without all the sort of distractions. That's a good way of putting it. So do um, prepare yourself for these uh, concerts, because they will, be, they, they will be wonderful. But it's even better if you can learn German between now and... Um, <laughs> Anyway, we have time uh, for, for questions. Uh, we, have a, we have a mic, is that correct? Uh, so um, the best thing is if you have a question for Ian, uh, just um, to put your hand up. A question here from this gentleman in the checker check. Sorry, wait. Ian. Ian, how can you develop your mood when you sing so many uh, two cycles of the set stories? And then after you are singing, do you need something to soothe your you know, sadness? Yeah, I mean, it probably has a bad effect on my mood generally. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it seems very. It seems like a rich. It's a, there's a sort of ritual to the whole thing. Uh, you you arrive at a concert hall. You do your rituals of putting on the clothes, and uh, I mean, I always have a ritual. In I was disappointed this this uh, last summer. I was in a there's a wonderful place in uh, festival Schubertiade festival in in Western Austria in the, in, in Schwarzenberg, and I always always have. Um, an Apfelstrudel at uh, six o'clock before I give a concert at eight. And this year, they didn't, um, th they wouldn't do that anymore. The hotel had changed. So like my whole, ri the whole ritual thing was, <laughs> was destroyed. So I think containing it into a ritual is, is the thing. And then afterwards, I do find, you know, sometimes I can, I can come out of it and sometimes I feel a bit like I don't really want to talk to anyone afterwards. But mostly it's okay. And having a beer is a real help. Okay, we'll get you some apple strudel um, before you <laughs> perform. And uh, when you sign those CDs and things, you know, if he's in a really bad mood, it's nothing to do with him. Okay, <laughs> right. There were other questions. There's a question here in the front. So I, I'm ignorant of the subject, but I'm wondering this journeyman leaping into the brook, first <laughs> sort of pouring his ha heart out to the brook, and then leaping into the brook. Would one way to understand this be the brook is almost a stand-in for the, the the woman he loves, and he puts so much of himself that into the brook that falling in love with someone is like transcending the self by merging. So in, he can't have the girl, so he's going to merge himself with the, the stand-in for the girl instead. Uh, yes, I think that's part of it. But I think it's also got a lot of myth mythical resonance because um, uh, it's, a, it's a sort of Narcissus idea, isn't it? He's, he's, he, I mean, he doesn't explicitly say that he's looking at his own reflection, but... Um, this idea, it, there's something narcissistic about sort of talking to a, a brook, and he doesn't really, he doesn't engage with her, and he's slightly scared of engaging with her, I suppose. And I mean, uh, that's the sort of sexual dynamic in the piece is that you've got this sort of threatening s sexual being, and, and the, 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 the whole idea of the Miller boy, he describes himself as being, you know, pale and white and, you know, covered in flour. He's, uh, he's sort of, he's, he's, he's not really a contender. Um, so no, I think that's, that's definitely part of it. Other questions? There's, there's one here and there's one here too. So you, um, you mentioned the, the different forms of the songs, right? Some are strophic. And you know, one of the great innovations in Schubert is to take the strophic poetry and set it in a way that's not strophic. Yep. And that, as a, uh, that, that seems like it might be perhaps more obvious to me as in the way that you might deliver that as a performer. But can you talk to us a little bit more about how you handle the strophic songs? What do you do when you're you know, you, you're singing the same thing over and over again in terms of performing that and delivering a narrative? I think it's, um, it puts a lot of, um, it puts a lot of emphasis on finding um, the, 
using the words to inflect the melody. Um, somebody was tweeting about this today that I saw about, you know, the way that I sing And I talk a lot about Bob. I've, I really like Bob Dylan. And one of the thing, amazing things Bob Dylan does, he's got, you know, he's got not a classically beautiful voice. I mean, I'm talking about in the 60s, which is the stuff I've listened to. But he has a real capacity to use the words to inflect and change the melody in, a, in surprising ways to, to, to sort of bend the pitch and uh, without it sounding out of tune. Um, and you have to do something of that, not in quite the same way, but... Um, and then there are obvious strategies, like, you know, you find the quiet verse, the loud verse, the, you find the verse where you do an, an unexpected enjambement, or... Uh, and you find different ways, that different things for the, for the piano to do. I mean, there's one song in Die Schöne Minuen where when I first recorded it with Graham Johnson, he'd found um, a version uh, uh, for a, a small piano where it was played in an octave up. And so we did one verse an octave up. And uh, so there are lots of ways of, of, of dealing with that. Um, but you're very aware of, when you're singing a strophic song, I suppose you're very aware of the, of the verse form. And what's interesting, as you say, when Schubert composes, uh, use, uh, takes strophes and, and then three composes them, is the way that a lot of the poetic structure and even the rhyme structure is, is destroyed and you don't really hear that anymore. Lady here. Um, yes, um, I think your uh, career path seems very unusual and mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm myself a scholar and I have very strong passion for music. So I was just wondering, um, what's your, uh, have you ever regretted after giving up your academic <laughs> you know, as a scholar? And if you could share with us some of the stories, the most challenging thing. The other thing is you were to, the second one is you were to do it again, right, from when you were born. Would you still, you know, do this uh, academic scholarship and then move to musician? In other words, do you think that the earlier stage of academic training help your uh, later uh, uh, musician? I think, I think academic training helps with um, sort of focus. Uh, uh, so I think I have been very focused. Um, I think, I've, I mean, if I, had, if I was 20 years older, I would never have become a singer because I would have got a job straight away in Oxford and I would have, or somewhere, or, you know, I would have got an academic job and I wouldn't have been tempted to do this strange thing. And the re only reason I did it really was because um, of what happened in the UK after 1979, which is that the universities, the prospects for being in universities changed. I mean, they're now even worse. I mean, much, much worse, but which makes it now seem like, the, you know, the 80s are, are a golden age in comparison. But um, and my tutors in in the history faculty were very depressed about the prospect of anyone ever getting a job and and the way that respect accorded to ac to academics in the British system had changed and and that again that's much worse I mean it's probably worse in the UK than anywhere else in the world at the moment but um, so I and I, d I regret you know I uh, I love doing what I do I, d I sometimes want to be feel I feel a bit like I'd like to be more settled and um, uh, more at home so it has its, its ups and downs. Yeah. And if you were to start your life all over again, would you then um, just go, you know, I don't know, the Royal Academy of Music oh, no, or something? I would never, I'd never have wanted to go to, I wouldn't have wanted to go to a conservatoire, I think, which is, uh, I just don't, I'm really glad I had an, I mean, I'm glad I had an academic, I mean, I really loved my schooling and I really loved university and, you know, I was in I was in the education system for you know from the age of three to the age of thirty. So that's uh, twenty seven years is probably a nice portion. I you know I think of I like to think of life. You know, I've, when I was at Oxford, I studied uh, Aristotle's Politics, and Aristotle has an idea of there being different things to do at different stages of your life. And so I think you know I was in the education system from nursery school through to the end of being a research fellow. And I've been a singer for you know now for twenty five years, and but maybe now I'll you know maybe I'll do something else. Yeah, come and well teach, think. come and teach, teach here. I'd like Uncle to. You. Yeah, that'd be yeah. cool. That'd be great. Cool. Anyway, <laughs> but we'd all like it, right? <laughs> Other questions? There's a question there. Yes. I want to know if you have to choose which one is your which song is your favorite in Winter Heights. Ooh, that's so hard. Um, I actually really like Die Post because you've, you've been on this real uh, sort of decline. And, I, uh, you know, the first 12 songs of Interizer were originally composed as a, as a separate cycle. I mean, as, as a cycle in its own right, and it's only then Schubert composed them. And Die Post is suddenly this sort of 
leap up. You've had this um, downward, downward, downward depression, and then suddenly he's, you know, in a f it's it's a bit full. It's false hope, but it, it, it's 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 lovely to be able to to be a little bit bouncy. I was also wondering actually, which would be which would be the scariest song uh, in either of the cycles? Do you think? I think the two scariest songs in Winterizer are the um, are the the one um, Der Greiser Kopf which has an extraordinary melodic shape. And then the, the, the crow is very scary, yeah. Uh, literally scary, or? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a question, um, I can't see the hand. Uh, when you're performing on stage, what e exactly is going on inside your head? Do you see images, or you see, um, images as in what is depicted in the, in, the, in the text, or are you so concentrated that you think about Music only, or ah, I do. it depends on how well I know the piece. Um, if the ideal for me is to know a piece as well as I know Winterizer, but that's not going to happen that often. But if I if I'm performing Winterizer, I can sort of it's it's a bit like being a sleepwalker or doing it on autopilot and things. Um, I'm th I suppose I'm thinking mainly thinking the text and the and the I don't know. There are all sorts of things are happening. It's a very I don't know if you could if I could if if I tried to write down a sort of um, you know, my experiences, it would be a very complicated melange of stuff because sometimes there are dis distractions. You know, I'm facing the audience, so I see every, I see you all when, when I perform, and that has an impact. You know, if someone's going to sleep or someone leaves <laughs> or someone's coughing too much, or as the most, in, the most, uh, the most weird one was, uh, which I've written about in my book, um, there's in, in, in Wasserflut, the, the sixth song, um, of, of Winterizer, uh, the pianist Alfred Brendel, who, who I'm very fond of, um, he, he got very, very exercised about the issue of whether you should play a dotted quaver, semi-quaver, and three, and, and a triplet, whether they should be synchronized or whether they should uh, sort of slightly um, be apart in what he calls a Brahmsian polyrhythm. And I, I talked about this to Tom Adders, the composer, and he said, well, in this song, it's just sometimes it's one thing and sometimes the other, and you don't have to get you know, really hung up about it. But for some reason, very early in his career, I think in the 1970s, Alfred wrote about this, and some academic had written about it as well, and it became a really big issue for him. And um, I was doing Winterizer, I think with Julius Drake at the, at the Wigmore Hall, and suddenly in Wasserflute, I know, or maybe I'd already noticed him, but anyway, I was very aware of Alfred Brendel in, in the fourth or fifth row of the Wigmore Hall with the, with the score. <laughs> Um, sitting next to his son, Adrian, who's a cellist. And um, as we got to the crucial, he started going, <laughs> and then, and then, uh, he, he turned around and I suddenly realized that sitting in the row behind him was Mitsuko Uchida. Mitsuko Uchida, and he was pointing, he was pointing. <laughs> so, uh, so lots of, all sorts of things can, can go on. I even like, you know, all sorts of thoughts can go on. But one of the biggest determinants of, of how you perform is how you feel your voice is. I mean, there's a, there's a big thing in singing where people say you should sing on feel, not on sound, because you sing in many different spaces. And there's an element of truth to that in that you can, I mean, my experience of going around different halls is that if I sing in a very dry, un, uh, unacoustically live uh, space, I have to be very careful not to push. And earlier in my career, I used to push and really screw my voice up. Um, and I'm aware of that now. But on the other hand, what you get back, what you feel, and what you hear, it, it sort of inspires what you then do, and you then colour your voice differently. So different, you get different performances out of different spaces, out of different audiences, and all the sort of there's a lot of input going on. Yeah. So, well, when you're performing um, a role in an opera, mm. what's going on in, inside your head is completely different. From um, when you're I singing. don't know. I don't. I'm I'm quite interested in this issue of what people are really doing when they're acting. Um, <laughs> Because you know we have a we had the, the 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 popular the sort of reigning myth of the great actor is the sort of Daniel Day Lewis Lewis thing that you you know you live like that person and you are that person and I don't think that's not what that what matters in acting is what is communicated between the actor what the audience get and that I mean I think David Mamet's written quite interestingly about this it's about it's about technique it's it's not really about um, necessarily inhabiting something, but it, it also it's very various. Um, it depends on the structure of the piece. It depends whether you're going on and off. If you're in an opera and you're going off, 
you know, you'll be going back to your dressing room and you might be having, you know, having a conversation with somebody about something completely different. The, Im the most immersive experience I've had of, of acting in opera, um, apart from doing stagings of Winterizer, which isn't an opera, uh, was doing um, Benjamin Britten's Death in Venice because then I'm on stage the whole time. And so you do, and it is, it, it is quite immersive and quite disturbing then. Especially a long, the long period of rehearsal with a very intense director, which I did. That that then does become immersive. So I think what I'm saying now is that it it, it depends. Any other questions? We just time for a few. Oh, people want to have second questions. Yeah. yeah okay. But okay. But there's a question here before, behind you. <laughs> How was your experience and your feelings about the staged versions of Interviser, especially the one with uh, Hans Sanders' music uh, version of it? I, I increasingly liked that, I, I think. I mean, the last time we did it was in Shanghai, and uh, I don't think it'll come back. And I, but I was sad that it's not coming back, because uh, I think it really actually was, was an interesting experiment. I mean, the, what happened was um, Hans Zender, who is a, 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 a contemporary, I mean, he's very old now, but a, a quite hardcore contemporary German composer, whose music doesn't get played an enormous amount. He was also a conductor. But he'd, much, probably much to his irritation, his most popular piece is what he called a composed interpretation of Winterizer, which is a sort of orchestration, but with dislocations. And the vocal line is always recognizable, but sometimes keys change in a funny way. The orchestration is weird. There are repetitions. It's actually a wonderful act of interpretation of Winterizer. And it's it sort of... Um, it expresses a, a deep involvement of Zender with, with the piece. And uh, I and a director friend of mine just decided to, to put it on, and she's, she works a lot with video. And what she did was she managed to get hold of a lot of footage from this f television film of Interizer I made um, in 1997. And so some of the, quite a lot of the um, piece became a sort of dialogue about the self and uh, aging and you know there were pictures of me looking very young and then me being what I am now and it, it I, I, I thought it was an interesting piece of work. This one question here again. <laughs> if we, uh, yeah, it's okay, we, I, it's fine, nobody else has put up their hand so far, So, but do, do put up your hand if you want to have a question. Oh. Yeah. So uh, your adolescence sounds a lot like mine right. um, and, and when you first uh, started singing this um, it sounds like you were very much romantic mm -hmm. um, and kind of giving expression to heartbreak. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, are you still a romantic when, when you sing this? Are you still drawing on that or has it evolved far beyond that? I think it evolves. I mean, I suppose I'm still a romantic in some senses, but I think you d these pieces you can invest with a lot of your life experience. And by the time you get to 54, your attitude towards um, life is a bit different from when you're 16, <laughs> 15. Um, I've, I mean, I'd, I've got a, f a friend who's, who d used to love Lida and then just said that, that just said to me, I, d I, I mean, rather rude. She can be quite rude sometimes. She said, you know, I don't understand how you can spend all this time doing this very adolescent thing of Lida. <laughs> um, and the thing is, I, 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 don't, I don't feel that they are, they, aren't, they, are, they are of interest to adolescents, but they deal with, you know, the deep issues of human existence in a very particular way way and in a way that I think is more satisfying than or as satisfying as any way they've ever been dealt with. Um, quite what they do, whether it, you know, what our theory of what, what, why, why do we like them? Are they cathartic? Are they distracting? Are they, I don't know, are we wallowing if we listen to them? I don't think so. I think we're processing in some way. But, um, you know, how do you see the future then of, of leader? Now that it's not adolescent, you know, what, how, <laughs> what, what is the future? That do you see a lot of you know new talent coming into this thing, or new ways of doing it? I see an enormous amount of interest in it, an enormous number of singers who want to sing leader, an enormous amount actually of academic interest, a lot more writing about the lead coming out of the academy. Um, some of it really enlightening, and some of it not, um, and. But at the same time, I see a sort of that the although in certain metropolitan centres it's very healthy, that there isn't the depth and breadth that there was in the 1950s and 60s or 70s, um, and it's strange to me, it's strange and wonderful for me that the main 
uh, center of, of leader singing in the whole world is London. Um, because the you know, uh, if you think of the, the, the centers of, of, of German culture that used to have millions of leader recitals, they, they do have them, but not by any means a lot. Whereas in, in um, at the Wigmore Hall alone in London, there are sort of 90 song recitals in a season, uh, which is an enormous number. Um, and I, it worries me that, you know, that that is an expression of uh, a sort of common European identity, which is at the moment in my country very much under threat. So uh, whether I know, I mean, it's under threat sort of in a cultural broad brush sense, but also I'm not clear, you know, the Wigmore Hall has got chamber musicians and, uh, and singers and pianists coming from all over the world probably most of them from, from countries belonging to the European Union. And after the March the 29th, is, 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 are they not going to be allowed to, if, if there's no deal reached in this ri ridiculous Brexit process, will they not be able to perform? I don't know. So it'd be great if you could really get into LIDA uh, in Hong Kong. It'd be a, w a wonderful opportunity for you to, as you listen to these two concerts, to really find something new and refreshing and maybe also to start a, a tradition here too. Thank you so much, Ian, for this wonderful, enlightening time. Thank you very Ian much. Foster.